Welcome to another lockdown video. Some time has passed. I've been procrastinating basically because I don't know how to paint my model. <laughs> Rather than procrastinating with the painting, what I thought I would do is I'd just jump on to doing some more conversions and make some more stuff for the army and I can just think about how I'm going to paint it while I am building it. And we've got some pretty ambitious ideas. So this episode, I'm going to cover both my approach to and the mechanics of kit bashing and converting. Kit bashing is just taking bits off one kit and putting them on another kit. So that could be a simple head swap, the humble head swap, a brilliant place to start. I will put up a picture here of my favorite head swap that I've ever done. And the reason that this one works so well is because you're putting a smaller head on like this hulking muscle bound brute and it just makes the gawking look even more feral. This little, little tiny head on top of this massive pair of shoulders. The conversion that we've got in mind is going to be using this model. It's horrible to build. Don't, don't expect to enjoy the building processes of this model. It has the most horrible gaps and sea lines are awful to get to. These joining points are recessed and sanding it was a nightmare. So over three sessions, <laughs> I built it. Despite that, it remains visually, at least, one of my favorite models Games Workshop have ever made. And I've got a lot of favorite Games Workshop models. Essentially, the idea for my conversion is to take Marathi's wings and put them on this model. Look at that. Looks like something from anime, doesn't it? So over the top. And this art me is not about being subtle. So that is the conversion that I'm going to be trying now. The reason that conversion is going to be really hard is because of the difficulties of converting order and chaos. I know that's a chaos model, but I'll explain what I mean. So anything chaotic, uh, you've got less requirements for symmetry, less requirements for precision, all of that type of stuff, which is why we can get away with this guy having four kits that have kind of been bashed together and then like this, um, it look, looks great and appropriate, but this kind of scrappy beaten up plastic card weapon that I can make myself, that went absolutely fine. And that's because he's a chaos model so I could get away with it. Despite the fact that this is gonna be a chaos model too and is a chaos model, it's a very elegant, precise and refined miniature. And that means that my converting is just gonna to have to be, even though it's simpler, I'm not gonna to have to scratch build to anything, I don't think, currently. Um, I'm just gonna to have to do it to a higher standard. However, if you're looking to do some simple conversions, then head swaps and weapon swaps are definitely the place to start. I will pop up a picture here of a Knight Heraldor, and on him, I've not even gone to another kit for this conversion or kit bash. I've just taken his sword, I've chopped off the handle, and I've swapped them to that position. So rather than holding his sword in the air, he's now leaning on it. It's, it's planted in the ground, and I've built up the base to accommodate that. This one is gonna be more difficult, so. Let's see how it goes. Let's jump in. I'm not quite sure how to start about this, honestly. Um, I need to pick which one of these fingers or bones or whatever you'd call them coming from the from the wings, um, which one of those the claw is going to appear between, and then that will dictate kind of the positioning of it on the back. And the most important thing, just this entire exercise is just results in me feeling like I don't have enough hands, is for me to find the most natural position for it to sit in on the back and off the back. Obviously I'm going to be having to hack some stuff away. I would like to hack away the absolute minimum possible. So I have, at great risk to my model, taken it off hyperlapse to show you just how difficult it is to get things to dry in place. Now, I could be pinning this and super gluing it, potentially, but there's just very, very little depth for a pin to go in there. So um, I'm literally expecting to be sat here for five minutes with my finger on this. There is no substitution for the degree of control you get holding it in place with your hands. I could try and work something out with elastic bands or something like that, but what this needs is just some patience. We're trying to do something pretty tricky and that has a price and that is that we've got to make this work as best we can. Now I, I've got a kind of a tacky bond. Carefully, I'm gonna drop glue into the recesses and then I'm just gonna drop off some bits of sprue there that are gonna get hidden, whatever we do. And I'm gonna press those in. These are really, really important. I do have the option to put a spot of plastic glue there on the back of the side, and I think that might be a sensible thing because if this was just not wobbling, we'd be, we'd be having a really, really solid bond here. So extremely carefully, I'm gonna put that on. Now I've got two points to hold. And hopefully with the kind of the, the bridging point that I just squeezed in below and the joining point here on the wing, we should be we should be at a point where 
we can almost remove our fingers from it without putting ourselves. I would say that's been successful. So now at this point, uh, with that bond there, I'm fairly happy. I can leave it dry like this. The only thing I might do is we've got some kind of wrinkling there from the flux that we've had. I might get a little clay shaper or a tool in there or even a knife and just see if I can smooth that out while I have the opportunity while it's still squishy. Uh, if not, it's absolutely fine. We can green stuff over it. So it all collapsed because I put it at the wrong angle and off camera, you've definitely missed out on some pretty fruity swearing. More patience than I was putting in needed, definitely. So I'm just gonna leave it in this orientation and hold it and we will we'll fix the mess that we have in the recesses somehow with sanding or sculpting or something like that. We're just here for the long haul. So believe it or not, my bendy arm that I have next to my desk is the only thing that is capable of holding this in exactly the right position. So that is where it's gonna dry. I'm literally gonna leave that for like 30 minutes. I have just taken this off the, the bendy arm that it was stored on and check this out. I'm so pleased with this. So it has been worth the, uh, the aggro. That just feels like like I'm, I'm putting so much force on it that I'm flexing the entire piece. That's how well it's joined. So now we just need to go about fixing the little imperfections that have resulted around where the bond's been. So step one, 1500 grit sandpaper. Obviously, if you want to keep your texture palette in pristine condition, I don't recommend using it as a cutting mat, but um, the amount of use and repriming mine get, I, I don't mind. So this angle is going to be okay to get at. The other angle, I am not so sure about. So uh, that is gonna, yeah, that is gonna be a faff. I can get in a little better than I thought I could, but I don't want to scrape off this shoulder. I love, I've already banged on enough about how much I think this model is incredible. So the idea should be that I don't want to ruin it. So let's see if we can make an extremely thin slither and use that to our advantage. This one, the wonderful thing about sanding sponges, if you guys haven't used them before, absolute flexibility to try and make the best tool for the job at least. I don't know if this will work, but it could do. That's not too bad. I'm gonna give it a go. I don't want to change the musculature of this model um, as much as possible. What is there is good, and it's likely that the stuff that I am adding is bad. I don't want to try and change uh, much of this, even if it's stuff that I think could be hidden. So I'm trying to scrape out a curved recess on the inside of this to kind of socket it to the back of the muscle, as we managed to do, luckily and conveniently, just due to coincidence of the, the shapes of the two different pieces over there. Um, it's a real problem though, because I've only got a flat blade, so making kind of the inside of a ball and socket joint is proving really tricky, which is why I'm keeping scraping it, dry fit, scrape, dry fit, scrape, dry fit, but um, we will persevere. If anyone was wondering exactly how Christmassy and stupid my jumper is, the answer is quite a lot pretty stupid. On the subject of me and my stupidity, imagine if you'd literally already done an episode talking about how useful curved knife blades can be for converting purposes and model preparation purposes, and then you've needed to make a curved recess joint. I guess I'll use the right tool for the job. <laughs> so you don't only need patience for converting, you need your brain as well. Whoops. What do you know, using the right tool for the job actually makes a huge difference. About a minute's work, I've managed to get in there and properly start the process of making this a genuine socket to our ball and socket joint. And this means that I can get it to the stage where I think what I'm gonna have to do, because the sequencing here is gonna be important, um, in order to get access for kind of sculpting and sorting out the, the bits that I'm gonna need to sculpt, it's gonna make sense to do this afterwards. So I'm gonna work out the best dry fit possible with this. I will then grease and stuff this shoulder wing joint, and then I'll put this one on, and that should leave me in a position whereby, because this one sticks kind of right out, or should be kind of sticking right out rather than being like at 90 degrees, kind of like this one is, this one's got the best access. So not by design, but rather by luck, I'm gonna be doing things in the right order. So getting at this one and then 
fixing that and then being able to get the one that should be the easiest to gain access to for smoothing it out. On the last one, I made the mistake of sticking it to the model before realizing that I had to sand down and smoothen this bit out. So I'm gonna make a start on that carefully because I think we're gonna to need to leave more of this than we did on the, the previous shoulder. That's beginning to make a lot more sense now, like a lot more sense. I could potentially pin this, but I'm not sure if I could get the pin in the right position very easily and it would be, be a bit of a weird one. Maybe I should consider pinning it. So I think we have our positioning decided now. I think kind of visually it would have been better had this been flat out, just really in your face. But in terms of it's like how natural it is for it to join to the model, there is the most natural spot. So even though I'm not happy with it in one area, I'm more happy with it in another area and it will make it far easier to get a solid bond. If you are wondering why my green stuff looks like it has come from the freezer, it is because it has. So top three tips of green stuff, and these are musts in my opinion. Number one, store it in the freezer. Number two, seal it when not in the freezer. And number three, cut the middle section out. If you hold those in mind, and as long as your green stuff was uh, pretty fresh when you got it, you will have practically zero issues with bits. Um, issues with mixing, hard bits, soft bits. You just make it way easier to work with, that type of stuff. And those bits you cut out of the middle, I tend to just set them to the side and then I use them for building up bases and stuff. It defrosts super fast, so you can literally just hold it between your hands and already we're good to go. So it is super convenient to do it like it. It's not a faff at all. Now I've swept all of my little fluffy things off my palette because I don't want them getting involved with my green stuff. Always helpful to work with a clean area or at least cleaner area when you're dealing with sticky putties. So I don't have a specific plan for this. I'm just gonna kind of mold it to the space that I have and then try and make things look fairly organic. It might be that it's best to do this in two stages. So I kind of build up a, uh, an armature or a skeleton and then kind of work around that and use that as the basis of what I have. Um, really not too sure at this stage. I'm not a, uh, a particularly seasoned sculptor by any means, so really here it's just trying to make stuff look round-ish is the name of the game. One of the things with conversions and painting in general actually is to, to know when to stop. And for me, the big learning point came when I realized as soon as you're not unhappy with it, with this type of stuff, like I'm not, I'm not trying to win a golden demon here. I'm not an incredible sculptor by any means whatsoever. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get this to a stage where I am fairly happy with it. It looks pretty smooth and it is acceptable. Um, without being awful and that is going to be enough for me. So this stuff's gonna be quite hidden behind there I will build that one up in a second stage, but for now I'm gonna do that and I'm gonna leave it to cure as well um, It's so easy to get a finger in the wrong place around this stuff. I might be able to sneak some stuff around the back I'll consider that at the moment, but um, yeah, it's really it, it's about taking the absolute maximum care possible and lowering your chances of screwing things up So pretty much where I'm going to leave it. Um, one thing to note if you're using, these are called clay shapers, um, if you're using a clay shaper you tend to struggle to smooth down the very very edges of your stuff because they can't exert enough pressure. Now you can get stiffer ones, mine are quite soft, the stiffer ones I would say are actually better for green stuff because clay is far more malleable than, um, than green stuff is. All right so we are done, so kind of mocked up on my desk there is how it's going to look but I'll, uh, I'll hold it up to the camera. I'm really, really pleased with the posing that we're gonna end up with here. I think the time put into kind of gouging out laboriously, laboriously, inventing words now, uh, gouging out that part of the shoulder socket has worked out really, really, really well and that pose is gonna be phenomenal. Really, really happy with that. Fairly pleased with how this is. Uh, like I said, you, in, unless you're gonna spend hours and you're gonna be willing to like literally like delete it and start again, or you're a god level painter, um, neither of which are applicable to me or to this army here, just getting something so you're pretty solidly happy with it and it is acceptable is kind of where I go to with sculpting. And a big thing that I wanna push is how patience is a really big part of converting armies and trying new stuff. 
drying times is a lot of it, but just the patience to be like, well, I don't quite know what I'm doing with that. I mean, case in point, I'm literally doing that now. I don't know what I want to do with the paint job. I'm not 100% decided yet. So I'm just gonna make productive use of my time building more models. And then in the process of building them, maybe I'll kind of get a flash of inspiration or something a viewer says, I'll be like, right, great. Magical energy mixed with yellow and blue on one side of the base and the other side of the base is perfect. That's where I'm going with it, you know, that type of thing. So it's just be willing to take the time for your kind of, for your ideas to percolate and for your miniatures to dry. <laughs> like, it's a really big deal, but if you're willing to do things in steps and approach stuff like this, you will net save a load of time and probably end up far happier with your end result. That's it really, I hope you liked the video. It's a bit of a different format and hopefully it doesn't feel too odd for the net result of a video to be one sculpted shoulder but I really want to give you guys the idea of the amount of thought or time that goes into my personal projects when I'm approaching stuff like this and hopefully there's plenty of tips along the way with like how to deal with green stuff, different products to use, accessories to use, sculpting tools, you know that type of thing. So I really hope you've enjoyed it. If you have any suggestions, if you have any um, comments on like what you would like to see in the next lockdown video, what you'd like to see in the next videos in general, or questions about why I'm approaching things how I am, suggestions for like maybe there's some amazing sculpting tool out there that I've never heard of. Anything like that would be massively appreciated. Do pop them below, we read each and every comment and they have been brilliant. And uh, I just thought I'd let you guys know that the moment we get to 30,000 subscribers, which isn't that far off now, which is incredible, I will be doing a 24 hour army challenge and it is going to be the demons of corn. So please like, comment and subscribe and I'll catch you in the next video.